There are plenty of reasons to visit Newfoundland and Labrador. For anyone interested in the sea, it's a must. Those who come to the Maritime History Archive at Memorial University will receive a warm welcome. They'll also get a glimpse into the rich, exciting, and sometimes unsettling histories of merchant seafarers. Men and women who crisscrossed the North Atlantic and other waters during the 19th and 20th centuries. Distant researchers can also explore the archive's collections. Photocopies can be sent in the mail or digital images through email. Yet there's nothing quite like being there. Handling these documents and seeing how they fit together, it makes a whole lot more sense when you see the entire document. And then there's always the possibility that you'll find yourself on a paper chase across the centuries. The intention of this website is to make that hunt easier and to show you some of the things we could only begin to describe with words. A potentially exciting search begins here in the reading room where researchers consult ship's logs and crew agreements. This collection was so sprawling that it was once thought too large to maintain, but Memorial University intervened to preserve it and the archive's extensiveness has now become its greatest asset. This is the largest collection of its kind on the planet. Although we cannot promise that you will always find what you're looking for, we can say that you will enjoy the search. There are things here that will surprise, perplex, and delight even the most seasoned researcher. And amaze a new one. Hi, I'm Harry White. And I'm here at the Maritime History Archives because my family, we've always known we had people who went to sea. Originally, we're from Prince Edward Island, farmers and seafarers, at least according to the census. But I'm just starting to now do a proper job of finding out about the family members who left the land. We have the best information on my great-great-grandfather, Captain Alexander McCray, and his brother. Some of their letters from away have survived, and it was in one of those letters, written by Alex in 1889, that led us to identifying a ship. So I'm here. We got lucky when he named the Andretta in a letter because that led us to finding a picture of it on the internet. Now, it's an exciting thought that all those men had to sign on before their voyage to Melbourne because that's where the picture was taken and because that means a lot more evidence of them might survive. Preserved beyond this room are tens of thousands of crew agreements and other wonderful documents. The more information you can give an archivist, the better your chances of finding what you want. So, I have the name of the vessel, and I have the year. That means the archivist can probably find the crew agreement I'm looking for. But my chances are even better because I have the ship's official number. And here they told me why. Numbers are more reliable than names. There could have been several vessels named Andretta, but only one 88263. Of course, that wasn't what it said on its bow. That's the number the officials gave the vessel. And it's the very same number they use here to shelve these documents. The archivist helped me find this information, but you can find the same information for yourself on this website. The archive is a massive maze of a room, and only the archivist can go where the documents are stored. They say if you line the boxes up, they would extend for 12 kilometers or more. For my year, 1889, there are almost 400 boxes, and amongst the documents filed in them, the archivist has to find that number, 88263 the number that for me is the sailing ship Andretta. So I've got the crew agreement here and I'm scanning the list for my great-great-grandfather. And he's not here, at least not on the first page. But there is a master, two mates, a carpenter, a sailmaker, and a lot of able-bodied seamen, uh, sailors I guess. And that's roughly the size of the crew in the picture, the adults anyway. There's a lot of young boys there too. And there he is, Alexander McRae. He signed here. Says he's a mate. His pay, seven pounds a month. Apparently he signed on in Gothenburg in 1887, just a couple of weeks after the Andretta set sail from Antwerp. And he stayed with her until she arrived back in Bristol, England in 1889. Apparently the last leg of their journey took them around the west coast of North America, since their consul stamped these documents in Los Angeles and Astoria, Oregon. But what about Melbourne? Where does that factor in? Since remember, that's where the picture was supposed to have been taken. And, and there it is. Melbourne. Apparently the ship was in Melbourne between February and March 1888. And so was my great-great-grandfather. 
Chances are then that he's in that picture, as a 26-year-old mate, set on a sea career, on climbing the ladder till he eventually becomes a master. Other crew came and went. There were an amazing 70 individuals in this one long voyage. Some packed their bags and left in Melbourne to seek their fortunes in Australia, and evidently without the master's permission, since he has them listed as deserters in this column here. There's probably more information about them in this document here, which is the ship's official log, and it came with the agreement. There's a whole career, and a whole part of Alex's life opening up in these pages. But evidently, that'll have to wait for another day, since I think the archives are closing. Yeah, time to go, but I'll be back. <laughs>